Halloween night is one of the biggest holidays celebrated now worldwide with costume parties, spooky events, or originally a day where people believed the souls of the dead returned and you'd wear costumes to, to ward off the spirits. On Halloween night of 2001, this Korean student attending State College in Pennsylvania goes missing with absolutely no trace. Not one single clue left behind. It's as if she vanished like a ghost. The only potential break in the case would be a tip by a criminal who claimed he knew who took her and killed her. But that has its own twist of the story leading to a crazy chase of finding out the truth about Cindy. But it still leaves her case to be unsolved and we hope that someone will come forward 22 years later with possible new information. And if it wasn't Halloween night, would Cindy still be here today? Someone out there absolutely knows what happened to this girl. This case has been long forgotten, gone cold, and now we have the power of social media. So I really hope that you guys could share the story, listen to the whole video and hear out who she was and why this case is just so crazy and fascinating at the same time. It's now fall, it's kind of getting colder here. So it does remind me of one of my favorite holidays, which is Halloween. You guys know I even have a song about Halloween. And to keep myself healthy all year round, you guys know I love to take care of my body. And one of the ways that I've been doing that for the past year is Care Of, who have been an amazing sponsor of true crime videos like my channel. Sometimes they're very hard to monetize. Care Of is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders to your door every month. You can take an easy quiz about your diet, lifestyle, and health goals. They recommend you the right vitamins and supplements to what you need. My personal goal is having a good skin and overall health. I'm personally taking the ashwagandha, which helps me to de-stress and focus. It's definitely something that I need. And one of my favorite things that I always get from care of is the matcha collagen powder. These are high quality collagen powders. That's great for my skin and hair. Care of makes it delicious to take your supplements and vitamins. And did I mention that these are plant-based compostable packs so you can put them in your composters? I personally trust care of because they are high quality ingredients and it's hard to find high quality ingredient vitamins in store these days. They're offering 50% off your first order so that they make it so easy for you to try it and see if you'll love it. Remember to use my code for the discount and thank you so much to care of for supporting true crime videos. Cindy Song, or her Korean name Song Hyun Chung, was born on February 25th, 1980. And back in 2001, she was just 21 years old. She was born and grew up in South Korea until 1995 at the age of 15. She moved to Virginia, USA to live with her relatives, to study English, and attend high school. Cindy would go on to graduate high school with good grades and attend Pennsylvania State University. She was 5 foot 1, 110 pounds. She had long black hair, brown eyes, has a Pisces sign tattoo on the back below the waistline. She would have two part-time jobs and one of them was working at a Korean restaurant. She also attended full-time school. She was dedicated in studying. She loved being athletic. She did tennis and track. She loved music, photography, and art. And friends called her the fierce, independent woman. She majored in art and she actually frequently wrote her feelings and her love for you know photography, art, and things like that in her blog. I'm not sure what blog looked like back in 2001 and what platform she used. The only early on vlog sites that I can remember is Zanga. I'm not sure if Zanga was like what she wrote in. Now there are infos out there that Cindy did have a boyfriend and I believe this was one of her first serious relationship and I believe he was another Asian American named Richard. They've been dating and living together in an apartment but apparently in September 2001 Richard had broken up with Cindy. She needed to find a new roommate. She was heartbroken and she was actually going to therapy and taking some anxiety medicines. I don't know due to the breakup or she was getting this before, but you know, she was getting the help that she needed to kind of get over those bumps in her life. Because her boyfriend left, she needed to get a new roommate and she did and she met Catherine. Catherine was a new female roommate and they've been living just about a month together. So now it's October 31st, Halloween day. And of course, college girls and boys, you have to party. Cindy is a senior in college. She just turned 21 that year. And of course, like 
you have to like drink and have fun. Although Halloween on this particular year was on a Wednesday and they said that, you know, she doesn't party on the weekdays because she's so busy, but this was a particular night that she wanted to go out with her friends. And there was apparently a costume party at a club called Players Nightclub on College Avenue. And she decided to attend here with Stacy Park and Lisa Kim, whom she considered as very close friends. Cindy would dress as a cute bunny girl in bunny ears, white tennis skirt, a tail, brown boots. But her friends say that her version of the bunny girl wasn't the sexy bunny girl. It was a very cute, more of the modest version. Her friends also remember that she did have fake lashes on and this is going to be a very important information in just a bit. Now the three friends decide to stay out late. Of course, no one wants to come home like their parents would like you to at 11 a.m. on Halloween day. Now little story here, I personally love Halloween but ever since last year and just what's happening throughout the world, I'm very careful on Halloween day just because Last year on Halloween, I was in LA out with my friend. We were in this alleyway making TikTok videos. Yes, that video. That's when we had three big ass, like tall men that are masked so we couldn't see their faces and they had a baseball bat. Like all of them had baseball bats. Now technically, because it's Halloween, people are masked and you think it's a costume. Now those three guys came up to us and they just said nothing, no expression, and they were just literally grabbing their bats and like looking at us up and down. And then that's when I quickly realized, oh my god, these guys are up to no good. And it made me realize, oh my god, Halloween, people could literally have weapons and you would just think it's a joke. Where it made me realize Halloween day is a day that you really have to be careful because people are going to take advantage of people wearing costume, of parties. So anyway, Cindy and her two friends went to the nightclub. They stayed till 2 a.m. and decided to go to another house party. They moved to their friend's apartment, ate, partied a little more, and at 4 a.m., their friends say that they dropped Cindy off in front of her apartment building. Now, her close friends say that they saw her walk up the stairs to her apartment, and that's when they left. But of course, who would have known that that would be the last time they would ever see her again? And from here is when things get so strange and spooky. The next day, Catherine comes back to their apartment. Now, Catherine is Cindy's roommate and she did not stay there because she was at her relative and she came back the next day. So she realized that Cindy's room was locked. She remembers that specifically. So she thought that maybe Cindy went to class, went to work or whatever. They did have things planned that day. So now it's Thursday, November 1st. They were supposed to hang out after school that night, but Cindy never came back. Cindy would not show up to her classes on Friday as well. Now it's Saturday and friends did not think much of it until she did not show up for her shift at the Korean restaurant. This is when the friends knew that they had to report it to the police and something might be very wrong. Unfortunately, because it was a Saturday, they had to wait two more days for the police to show up for the missing person's report. On November 5th, Monday, five days since she technically disappeared, police showed up to Cindy's apartment and started to try and notice if there were any suspicions. There was no forced entry, nothing broken, and no particular odd suspicions that they can find. They did find Cindy's fake lashes that she wore that day that was on the top of her sink. This meant that she did come inside, take off her lashes, and then something happened after. Along with that, they found her school backpack and cell phone, which was left. And the only thing that seemed to be missing was her purse, which had her license, credit cards, and apartment keys inside. Her outfit she wore that day was also not found, so we believe that she was missing with the outfit on and she didn't change her clothes yet for some reason. A little comment here, when girls take lashes off as a woman who wears makeup, it means you're done for the day. Trust me, like lashes are one of the first things that women take off because it's uncomfortable. And when you take your lashes off, like your eyeliner is like messed up and like you just know you're done. You're not ready to go out anymore, party, nothing. Like, so at least coming from me with this lashes explanation, it, it really seemed like she wanted to go to sleep and call it a night. Now, strangely enough, when they looked into her phone, 
there was no other incoming or outgoing calls from her cell phone, meaning that nobody called her up saying that, hey, come outside, come for another party, or her calling someone and trying to meet someone up. I mean, you would think that if someone that she knew was outside the door, they would call her cell phone and she would physically come outside. So nothing, no incoming or outgoing calls, no suspicious emails, no one threatening her, fight, drama, nothing. Now they did check her credit card. Apparently there was a 24 hour little supermarket across from the streets of where they were living. It was about like a, from what I saw on the map, it was about like a five minute walk still. And maybe she got home and she wanted to do a quick errand. Maybe she wanted to get something, some water or whatever that she just needed at that moment that she couldn't wait till the morning and decide to have a quick run to the store. They did check her credit card statements and there was nothing. So she did not spend any of the money now does she have cash maybe but they possibly wanted to get the cctv footage that could have been near that store but unfortunately by then the footages have been overwritten by other footages and this was 2001 which is very common they would probably use tapes and tapes do not run too long so a lot of the times they would just use the same tape over and over again so no footages of cindy no purchases made so it made people believe that if she wanted to go to the store, she did not make it there. Now, according to the police, this is not a crime scene because this is just a missing persons report. There was no blood, no body, no suspicions or break-ins to the house. So it was kind of limited what the police could do. As of right now, it seems like she literally just walked out and vanished like a ghost. The second thing would be that did Cindy run away on her own? Again, maybe she was drinking, things got into her head about the breakup and she was taking anxiety medications and, and things just blew up. But her friends say that that is not likely of Cindy because she was planning ahead. Again, they had a Britney Spears concert to go to. She also had a new computer that was to be delivered on November 6th. She was about to hang out with Catherine the next day. She also applied for internship. She had two part-time jobs and she was not the type of girl just to drop everything and leave without notice. Friends also say, you know, that Halloween party, she was having an amazing fun time. Now, some people do say that, you know, when it comes to depression and anxiety, people, you know, hide things from others, which is possible. But again, according to her friends and what she left behind, it just doesn't seem like she would have vanished on her own. She left the door locked to her room for whatever reason, which I thought it was a little odd because because, I mean, she knew Catherine wasn't home. I don't think she was gonna leave for that long. Again, she took her lashes off. She did not take her phone, which could have indicated that she was just about to, you know, take a quick walk and come back. Although it's 4 a.m., I would not leave anywhere without my phone. Um, but again, it's 2001. People had different behaviors with phones back then. And it seems like they never found her bunny ears. So it meant that she took that with her, which I also found it a little odd. Headbands have a little bit of a tension pull right here near near the ears, at least to me. And it just gives me a headache wearing it for too long. So I don't like headbands. So the fact that she didn't even take those ears off and left somewhere also leaves so much imagination. Again, coming from a woman myself, I, the headband will be the first thing I take off. So I mean, did someone knock on the door and tell her to come out for a second? Another thing which seemed a little stressed, but the only thing that police found was her diaries. And in her diaries, police could see that she wrote about experimental drugs like marijuana and ecstasy. Now these were just party drugs and her friends claimed that she was not a normal drug user at all. This is just something that she tried once or twice at parties and she just wrote about it so it made police question was she intoxicated with drugs that specific day it's halloween police did look into all the friends and the ex-boyfriend and they did see absolute no suspicions with them and ruled them out as people who might be possibly involved Again, we can't call them suspects because legally this is not a crime. So how much they interviewed them, not sure, but from every article I found, the police claimed that they were all ruled out. After Cindy was reported missing, the only tip that they got was from a woman, a witness who was walking her dog, says, 
few days after Halloween, she saw a woman who looked like Cindy in Chinatown in Philadelphia, which was 200 miles away, by the way. A woman yelled for help and was being forced inside a car. She claimed that she tried to say something to the man, but he yelled at her and told her to go away. She did report this to the police, but according to them, the witness changed the details of the story so much that they do not believe that this was Cindy and this could be just a possibly a hoax. And unfortunately, this was in Chinatown as well, so you could mistake any young lady for Cindy. There was a montage of the possible suspect, but absolute no leads. Police tried to search nearby parks, the dumpsters, and even used helicopters. Any place that she could be, and nothing. Cindy's family back in Korea was alerted and Cindy's mother and her brother came and flew all the way to try and help with the search. I want to jot a little note here. When the family arrived to the US, it's been about two months since Cindy had been missing. Because of that, no one had been paying the rent to Cindy's apartment. Therefore, I'm not sure if the landlord or whoever came and actually changed the locks to Cindy's room so that so the, fam so the family claimed that they couldn't even go inside her apartment when they arrived. So apparently, Cindy's family came to the apartment and cleaned a lot of the things up in her apartment. And this made police feel like, you know, if there was any evidence or anything left behind, you know, they can't use it anymore because it's all gone. It's cleaned up. Now, coming from an Asian, like Asian parents clean up their children, no matter if they're adults or not, they clean up their room because they care about them. And especially to Cindy's parents, like they hoped that she would come back, come back to her clean apartment. And by then, I mean, I think it's been a couple weeks since Cindy's parents came. I mean, by then the police should have gotten any evidence if it, they were in the apartment. Any fingerprints or evidence might be gone by then anyway. So Cindy's parents hired a lawyer. They went around campus, they gathered, students after students to help find Cindy. And they felt like police weren't doing much. Apparently there was only just one lead detective in this case. Three months after her disappearance, family and the groups of people dedicated to look for Cindy held a press conference, including their lawyer. And they criticized the police department for not doing enough. But there were talks about race, like were they kind of, you know, disregarding this case because she is not American. I mean, technically she's an immigrant. But again, according to the police, because there were was no crime scene, no body, there was not much that the police can do without court approval. So they can't get warrants. The next thing police could do, because there was literally nothing to go off of, they used a psychic. The psychic was named Carla Barron and she appeared on multiple TV shows and she does do crime cases like this. So Carla would be brought to take around, I believe the campus and around where she lived. And according to her quote, she said, when this first came up, I seen three to four men that were with Cindy, so I knew that this was abduction and I knew it was sexual in nature. And I'm just seeing her being loaded into this vehicle. Then I see it wasn't very long before she had crossed over. Now, unfortunately, there was no names, no faces, no leading to the body. So unfortunately, police couldn't even really use this for it to lead to anything as well. And in 2002, her story was featured in Lifetime's Unsolved Mystery documentary, which exposed her to a lot of people. But this documentary is 20 years old and I try to find it everywhere and I can't watch it. I, I, it's not online. So the question remained, why did Cindy lock her door? Why did she still have her bunny ears on? Where was she going? Was she going to get food? Where was Cindy? It seemed like her case was going cold until 2003. Could this be the biggest breakthrough or false hope in Cindy's case? And the story is just about to get even more bizarre and twisted from here, you guys. Just try to stay with me. So in June 2003, a man named Paul Weekly came forward to police saying that he had some tips some juicy stories to confess to and wanted to be an informant for the police. Now, Paul Weekly is a career criminal. He was already facing felony burglary charges. He was about to face many years in jail and in exchange for possible reduction in sentence, he was going to become an informant for the police. So this guy, Paul, claimed that he had an accomplice named Hugo Selinski. Hugo Selinski was also another career criminal and he was just even a bigger bad boy than Paul. Hugo was in trouble with the law since his youth from burglary, assaults, I mean, you name it. Now, Hugo was already wanted by the police because he was a prison escaper. 
Yes, there was even a documentary about Hugo because his prison escape was crazy. <laughs> and somehow only within a few days of being in prison for a burglary charge, he somehow found a loose nail in the prison's window. Within a few days, he was able to gather 11 bed sheets and somehow was able to get the prison window open with these loose nails. He literally made a Rapunzel escape. He literally tied 11 bed sheets and that's how he got down from this prison. He even brought a flimsy mattress topper thing in order to put over the spikes to finally escape. I mean, they described this, this guy as fearless. He doesn't care. He will do what he puts his mind to. And another prisoner actually tried to escape right after Hugo and he lost his grips and became permanently paralyzed, leaving Hugo to be very lucky that he was even able to do this. So Paul weakly claimed that Hugo had another accomplice named Michael Kurowski. Michael Kurowski was a pharmacist who was running also an illegal prescription drug ring. According to Paul, you know, Hugo and Michael was out on a Halloween night and they were in their car and they abducted someone that looked like a prostitute. They took her into their car, brought them all the way to Hugo's house, which apparently was about two hours away from, from where Cindy was. They assaulted her, kept her in a vault for a couple of days, and then finally killed her. Now, why would a pharmacist like Michael be even involved with someone like Hugo? Allegedly, again, Michael was running this illegal prescription drug ring and he considered Hugo to be one of his best buddies. Then Paul claims that Hugo killed Michael because Hugo was angry that Michael kept Cindy's bunny ears as a souvenir you know, like a sick souvenir that killers do. And that Hugo did not want any evidences left and he got mad at Michael and decided to kill Michael and his girlfriend. Michael's girlfriend was Tammy Fassett. Now, Paul didn't specifically say that this lady was Cindy, but the story really matched up with who Cindy was. Paul would go on to say that Hugo was responsible for up to 13 people's death and police went and raided Hugo's large like mansion-like property and found 12 of the bodies buried in his backyard. Police did do a DNA test and two of the bodies actually turned out to be Michael and Tammy. So police did find Paul's story to be somewhat credible because everything else he said seemed to match up. But the other bodies, according to the police, were other drug dealers. And unfortunately, none of them, the 12 bodies, were Cindy. So then Paul would go to change his stories multiple times. He would now claim that Hugo killed Michael because he wanted to steal Michael's stash of cash. Again, Michael was running a big illegal prescription thing and he had made about a million dollars doing this and they wanted a cut of it. Hugo apparently threatened and tortured Michael and Tammy to tell them where the cash was and eventually ended up killing them. Michael actually, before when he went missing, he pled guilty to the prescription drug ring and he was about to serve time in prison. That's when he went missing. So police throughout this whole time thought that Michael was on the run, but they found out that he was actually dead. So in 2015, actually, after multiple changes, Paul pleads guilty to Michael's death as well, meaning that Paul was involved in the killing of Michael and Tammy. Paul then goes on to confess that he changed his stories and blamed it on other people to isolate himself from the murders. And I believe for the exchange, Paul did not receive the death penalty and he just got life in prison. Police also found in Paul's computers articles downloaded about Cindy's case. So they actually believe that Paul guy was just bluffing. And basically he also was involved in Michael's murder, but he wanted to make up a story to blame it on Hugo all on his own. Paul's story with Cindy being involved kind of doesn't make sense. They lived pretty far from where Cindy was. And the whole stealing the bunny ears and then murdering his friend for that, I mean, it didn't really make that much sense. Before he confessed to Michael's murder, he also had this version where he said that Michael liked Asian women and that's the reason why they kidnapped. So the story kept changing and eventually he pled guilty to Michael's murder. I mean, criminals like him really never tell the full version of the story in order to really isolate themselves. And unless there's a benefit of telling the full honest story, they're not going to do that. I personally now, after reading all of this, say no, but police are not letting go the possible 
theory that Hugo was involved, but there was absolute no evidence in any connection to Hugo, Paul, Michael being involved in Cindy's disappearance. And apparently Michael is has died, so there's no way that he could speak up as well. Now, when Hugo was caught in 2003, where he actually turned himself to the police, it's crazy, but he had a lot of female fans. There were female fans making songs about Hugo and how good looking he was, how charismatic, his smile, his eyes, he is definitely the bad boy that people like. Hugo and Paul are now almost 50 years old today and serving life in prison for crimes not related to Cindy. And now we have this whole possible false hope for the family that we know what happened to Cindy. So this leads to the ultimate conclusion. We're on base one again. What happened to Cindy? Where did she go? Who took her? Cindy will be 42 years of age today and people wonder, is she still alive somewhere? Was she trafficked? Could she still be out there? Did she really just walk out on her own and, and something happened to her self-harm? Where was she going? I mean, we don't even know if that 24 hour store theory is even correct because she was never found there anyway. Is there a knock on the door from someone? Did she open the door? Did someone snatch her right then and there? If she needed something at the store, what did she need that she just could not wait till the morning? Or could Hugo and Paul really be telling the truth and, and they're just hiding the real truth of what happened to Cindy. My heart just breaks for Cindy's parents and family because they have no answers 21 years later and they weren't even from America. They don't even speak the language or the culture barriers and things like that. So according to this article, the family actually claimed the police did not do a thorough search. According to them, they actually don't believe that they searched her phone and emails thorough enough, which could be possible. But I do believe that police would have said something if they did find something of significance. My camera battery ran out, so I'm switching to my phone, but there's not a lot of people talking about Cindy and there are a few YouTubers who made video about this. That's how I knew from Diva Jessica and a few of the YouTube videos. So now that we have power of social media, I am hoping that we'll reach out to a new audience, revamp these cases so we can let the family and the victim know that they're not forgotten. Her friends are now all grown up in their 40s. I'm sure they have their own life now. Even the detective who was working on this case he's retired now and the creepy thing is someone knows out there what happened to cindy and they could be walking around knowing and and keeping this a deep secret if any of you guys live in pennsylvania states or have heard about this case or live in the united states in general and know any information let's bring some awareness to cindy and hopefully we'll be able to find an answer for the family one day thank you so much for watching and see you in my next video